welcome to our presentation, A Journey to Africa. I'm going to be your host. I'm sure it's all working properly. I'm going to be your host for this journey through Africa. I warn you, it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind journey. Uh, we have a lot of countries to cover in a short time. I'm going to try and keep it to an hour, uh, but if I do go over slightly, please forgive me. Um, on that note, I we will take questions, but we will take them at the end. Uh, so if you have a question, you can write it in the chat box or you can save it to the end and then we will open up any questions you might have at the end. And that's just merely to kind of keep the presentation moving um, and so that we don't go over too much. So what we want to look at here, are the different destinations in Africa that might be of interest to you. Africa is a huge continent with many countries and uh, people often want to go Africa as a bucket list type of trip, but they're not sure exactly which country to pick. How do you, you pick one country over another? How do you know you're going to see what you want to see? What actually is drawing you to Africa? Uh, so hopefully this will answer some of those questions. A lot of these countries that we're going to look at will have a lot more to offer than um, just what we touch on, but it's just to give you kind of an overview of the different countries and what might make it um, them kind of unique and different and why they might want to be the destination that interests you. Um, and then maybe if one day you're lucky enough to see many countries, you, you can definitely know which ones and, and kind of plan out your route from there. Um, so I am Marianne um, and I will be the host for this tour and if any time you want to reach me at the Women's Travel Club feel free to, to call me and if you have any questions about Africa I'd love to answer or um, also Kirsten who's uh, our, and she's our leader of the tour host she's actually also very good with Africa and has done a lot of Africa so she's just a great resource too. Um, And so let's talk a bit about who we are. We're the Women's Travel Club. Uh, we do small group women only tours all over the world. And by small group, I mean we keep our tours limited to 16 ladies per tour, sometimes less, um, especially in places like Africa where we might be limited by the number of um, ladies that we can have in a, a vehicle. We will match roommates, so if you're looking to come on a tour and don't want to pay the higher single rate but don't have somebody to come with, um, feel rest assured that most women come to us as solo travelers, don't know anybody else on the tour, but definitely make friends and have some great friends by the end of it. Um, you can make some lifelong friends and we will match you with that roommate so that you can have kind of a friend to start and get right going um, on the tour. Okay, let's just look a bit about Africa in general. So Africa is uh, the second largest continent on earth with Asia being the largest. There are over 2,000 languages spoken in Africa, with Swahili being the most common. Uh, Africa is home to the world's longest river, the Nile, and it's home to the world's largest, hottest desert, the Sahara Desert, which also contributes to making Africa the hottest continent uh, in the world. There's 72 million tourists that visit Africa a year, and approximately 30% of Earth's remaining resources are located in Africa. Uh, so here's our map of Africa, and you can see there's many countries, uh, and we are going to touch on them all. We're going to just kind of highlight some uh, key countries that are definite kind of tourist destinations or places that you might want to visit. We're going to start in Southern Africa. We're going to start with South Africa, which I always think is a great place to start in Africa. If you're not sure, South Africa is 
an excellent option. It is definitely um, what I like to call Africa light, because <laughs> just why so many chat. Um, so uh, it's if you're if you you know you're sure you want to see the big animals, you're not really sure you're ready for you know to delve into a, a bush type trip, then South Africa might be the destination for you. Um, also, let's go over to the west coast of South Africa and to Cape Town. Um, Cape Town is a very modern, very almost European or westernized town, has a lot of the big chains that you would recognize. Um, in restaurants and stores that you would know, malls and great infrastructure, um, some beautiful gardens in nature, as Kirschenbosch uh, Botanical Gardens right at the bottom of Table Rock Mountain, which is that big flat topped mountain. And if you uh, like to hike and trek, you can definitely hike up the Table Rock Mountain. Um, Boulder's Beach area, which is where you would see these little guys. That's a sanctuary for penguins. So it's uh, Cape penguins or South African penguins are down in uh, Boulder's Beach and you can get pretty close to these guys and get some great pictures and, and make a few little new friends. Um, definitely one of my, my favorite, anybody that's traveled with me knows. <laughs> One of my favorite areas is the winelands. Um, so South Africa is world renowned for its wineries and wines. Um, and I always tell people you cannot find a good glass of wine in all of Africa, most of it coming up from South Africa and from Cape Town area. Stellenbosch is one of the most favorite, famous areas that um, in this wine area and they do great winery tours it's a wonderful way to spend a day when you're in cape town just take a day and do some wine touring um also famous or infamous for a, a real rich and raw kind of history throughout south africa um including cape town you're going to hear stories of nelson mandela and apartheid uh you can even see robin ireland from cape town uh, right from the shore, and that's where Mandela was imprisoned for 18 years. Now we're going to head over to the other side of South Africa, and we're going to head over to Kruger National Park. Um, so you've done your kind of city tours and gardens and wine, and now you want to see some animals. So this is where South Africa is a great option. Um, Kruger is huge. It's one of Africa. It is actually one of Africa's largest national parks with nearly 2 million hectares. Um, almost all of African mammals live here and can be found, including the Big Five. I've done, um, been lucky enough to do uh, quite a few tours or uh, game drives through Kruger, and I can tell you that I've seen some of my best animal sightings in Kruger. I've seen the Big Five by noon. Um, I saw uh, big pack of hyenas playing like literally right roadside like not 10 feet from the road in a big mud hole and chasing each other with a bone and um i've seen packs of wild dogs and so it is a great option now don't think because you're just in south africa you're going to get not get the animal sightings you will it's just they have everything there. It's also very well appointed. It's got great roadways, uh, restaurants, gift shops, information areas. I lovingly call it the Disneyland of national parks in Africa because it does, um, is busy and um, it's the gift shop. The gift shop, I swear, if you walked in the gift shop, you would think you were in one, a gift shop at Disney World. It's got stuffed toys. It's got trinkets. It's got mugs. It's got everything. Like It's just like that. <laughs> but it is a great option, and it, you will see everything. And it's huge. And it, if the, you get away from the main entrances, you, could, you wouldn't know where you were in Africa. You're just in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it can be busy though and so when there's an animal sighting you may have four five ten vehicles 
converge uh, if it's a good sighting on that sighting that all these guys are talking to each other on radios and telling you know them when they see something and so everybody kind of comes to that if they're anywhere close will come to that sighting and plus it's a national park so you have just you know a family driving around in their own car and everybody wants to see it so it can be busy at animal sightings and everybody volleying for the best position um to to get some pictures of the animals so brings me to the next option which are private game reserves and i love private game reserves um national parks are government owned where private game reserves are privately owned and this means there's going to be less people. The only people in there are the people that they let in. And, and let, often that is a case of they have their own lodges and accommodations within their game reserve. And you have to be staying there to be out on a, um, a game drive. So there's a lot less traffic going on. And they often have rules that if they can only have say two vehicles at any sighting at any given time. So if you're not one of those two vehicles, you might have to hold back um, until someone leaves and then they radio each other and they leave and you can move in. And it gives for, with being a little bit more patient, you get a much better sighting. Um, you can also, they can go off of um, the main roads. On a, on a national park, they have to stay on the main roads on the private game reserves they can drive off the main road so taking a shortcut or if they want to get around that tree so you can actually see the lion they can do that which can make a difference um the uh guides the guides both for national parks and private game drive reserves are excellent but the private game reserves tend to have really above and beyond guides and often have spotters um, too on the, the vehicles. Uh, the great uh, camps and lodges. So these beautiful tented camps where you know you have a washroom, ensuite washroom that's just outstanding, right in your tent. Uh, that's usually at these private game reserves. So some of the most beautiful places I've stayed in the world have been on private game reserves in Africa. Uh, they can also offer bushwalks. So most national parks, you can't get out of a vehicle, um, depending on where you are in the country you're in. But in private game reserves, you can. So sometimes you can get out of a vehicle when it's safe. Um, a private game reserve in South Africa, we actually um, got to go and walk with cheetahs because Cheetahs are non-aggressive, and these ones were fairly habituated, I think, to humans. Um, so we got to go and walk fairly close to cheetahs, um, which was just such a cool experience. Uh, they also can offer um, bush walks kind of close to lodges that take you out on walks and show you things that you wouldn't see driving by in a vehicle. So a lot of the, the flora and fauna and insects and smaller animals and just things that you wouldn't notice driving through. And night drives is another one. So uh, being able to see some of those nocturnal animals that you wouldn't see during the day, uh, bush babies and such. Um, this is a picture of what they call sundowner, which is one of the best experiences in Africa, I think. And it's in the evenings, um, and they do it, uh, most private game reserves do it, and sometimes you can do it even in national parks, but not usually, depending on the country. Um, but these private game reserves will take you out, um, you'll be out on your evening game drive anyway. So game drives are either in the morning, first thing in the morning, or in the evening gang dusk. Those are two times you're, you're most likely to see any animals are kind of out and about. And so in the evening game drive, when you go out at dusk and as it's starting to get to um, sundown, they set up refreshments such as this out um, and you get out and you can kind of mill around and enjoy your refreshments as the sun goes down. And it's just so beautiful. 
Okay, speaking of the big five, um, let's talk about who the big five are. So they're not necessarily the biggest animals in Africa, although some of them are. Um, these, the big five was a, a phrase coined by big game hunters and it refers to the five most difficult animals to hunt on foot or the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. And so, I'm kind of anti-hunting, so sorry if you're not, but I'm kind of anti-hunting, so I'm all for the, the big five and for them to win. Yeah, go big five. Um, so elephant is one of the big five, of course. Um, lion, rhino, leopard, and the most dangerous of them all, the Cape buffalo. They're the most dangerous because they don't back down and they just tend to be a fairly angry animal anyway. So they're easily annoyed and tend to attack quite easily. But when you hear the big five, those are the animals they're talking about. Okay, so we're going to kind of continue our journey through South Africa. My little marker here. So, um, so Southern Africa is, are kind of these country, like if we draw a line, anything below that are kind of Southern African countries. Um, and then we'll get into like Eastern Africa and, and, and such after. So continue in our Southern Africa journey, we're going to head a little bit north and we're going to head to Zimbabwe. Um, probably the most famous um, attraction in Zimbabwe is going to be Victoria Falls. This is where the Zambezi River comes thundering over a 108 meter drop. Um, it's actually quite a spectacular sight to see. Uh, the Victoria Falls are very long, so where Niagara Falls, where the most water comes over um, an, an embankment, it this is probably not got the same volume of water, but it's definitely way longer and spread across. And when you're there, there's a few ways to view it. You, there is a walk that you can do right along the edge, and it's very small here, but I'm not sure if you can see kind of along here, there's a path, and that's the path of the walk, and it goes all the way along. And you can walk along and get great views of the water thundering over the edge. Um, it's a little misty, a little damp, but it is a beautiful sight and you can hear it and feel it and it's just amazing. Another great way to view the falls is they do helicopter tours. So they'll take you over um, the falls and it gives you that whole bird's eye view because it is so big and it's one of the ways to actually see everything at once. Um, but other than Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe might not be your safari destination of choice. It's got um, a couple national parks, uh, Hawaii being the biggest, which is a great national park. Um, but if you're really going for safari, um, it's not probably the country that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck kind of idea. Um, they are a, a, an odd country in that they have um, Victoria Falls in the town, which is quite prosperous in a tourism sense. Um, other than that, Zimbabwe does have the largest platinum and diamond reserves in the world. So it's a country that's definitely, the rich are very rich and the poor are very poor. Um, it's also a little bit corrupt. In the government. You don't see that if you're traveling there. If you're just visiting Victoria Falls, you don't see that aspect of it, um, but it, it's there. And um, their currency collapsed in 2008. So now they use currency of all of other countries. The US dollar is big there, the rand is big, um, but you can't get currency within the country. So uh, often Victoria Falls is a stopping point on other kind of safari trips. So it might go from South Africa up to Victoria Falls, or you might stop in Victoria Falls as you're gonna go through Botswana or such. And so whenever you go into Victoria Falls, it's often common to stay three or four days 
and or even less, maybe a couple days. Um, just you have to make sure that you have uh, US dollars with you if you want to spend cash. They do take credit cards at most places there. But if you want to spend cash, you need to bring US dollars and you can't get them within the country. Um, and um, that all being said, 90% of the population of Zimbabwe is educated. So we're just going to stop in Victoria Falls and then we're going to head to neighboring Botswana. Botswana is, I must say, one of my favorite countries in Africa. I just love Botswana. Um, Botswana is home to the world's largest concentration of elephants. And they say elephants never forget, and I think that's why they all come to Botswana. Botswana has had some of the best anti-poaching rules um, of any country in Africa. And so I think the elephants feel safe. They know they can't be hunted. They don't allow trophy hunting. So it, they're just safe and happy there, and they have all the resources they need, especially when you get up kind of to uh, the Chobe River area. They definitely have the water that they, they so need. Um, so if you like elephants, then Botswana might be somewhere you're, you might want to consider. Nearly 40% of Botswana is made up by national parks and wildlife reserves, so they have plenty of large areas to roam. Um, here's a map of Botswana, so we can look at a few different kind of key areas in Botswana. Uh, first, we're going to look at Chobe National Park, which is kind of up here. And Chobe National Park is, uh, runs along the Chobe River, and it's a true wildlife uh, sanctuary. It's just amazing. It's, uh, you can do land, game drives and you can also do um, boat drives on the water and you'll see different things from both. Uh, so they also do along the Chobe River uh, houseboat vacation. So you can stay in a houseboat and um, you can see actually kind of from Zambia and Namibia and Botswana right along that houseboat you kind of have access to all of that. And so that's that's really kind of something cool to do. I've never done it. I've seen a lot of them. I've always thought that would be fun. Um, so what else can I tell you about that? Uh, Chobe National Park has the most elephants in all of Africa, and you can literally hear the ground shake as a large herd moves by. I've sat on a patio on the at Chobe River Game Lodge overlooking the Chobe River and literally seeing a herd of 200 elephants, which is just a spectacular sight to see. One elephant is big. 200 elephants is just crazy. Uh, the one thing to note though, you will not see any rhino in the uh, Chobe National Park. They don't have any rhino there, unfortunately. So next we're going to move on to the Delta. The Delta Okamongo is kind of this area here and it is a very unique and special area in itself. It comprises of some permanent marshlands and seasonally flooded plain, uh, flooded plains. <laughs> It's one of the most unique characteristics of the site is the annual flooding from the river Okamongo, which occurs during the dry season. And the result is the native plants and animals have synchronized their biological cycles with these seasonal rains and floods. It's home to some of the world's most endangered species of large mammals, such as cheetah, white rhinoceros, black rhinos, and African wild dog and lion. I have to tell you, I've been to the Okamonga of few times and um, I haven't seen most of those animals there. I have seen uh, elephants for sure. I've seen giraffe, um, lion maybe, I can't say for sure. I think lion, um, definitely like some smaller like war hogs and things like that, but I haven't seen a lot of those animals that they mentioned there. 
Uh, the Okanbago is very different from anywhere else. When you do tours of it, you're going to usually do them by boat. You can do by motorized boat or um, a Makoro, which is a hollowed out wood canoe that you sit in and a puller uh, is behind you pushing along. So you go kind of quietly through. And a lot of what you see here with the um, you see the waterway and then you see what looks like land and often it's not land. It's just reeds very close together. So these Makoros can actually get through that. Um, one really cool thing that you can do in the Delta is camping. So some of the lodges will take you out for a night and uh, take you to a camp, which is not the tended camp like I talked like but before when you go camping this is real camping so this would be a you know semi-permanent like put up tent and um they'll have a barbecue kind of idea i've done it kind of basic and i've done it very luxury and it's been a great experience um the different times i've done it and really really kind of neat i'm going to show a video now of it, this is from a Makoro just kind of going through the delta and you can just see how peaceful it is and quiet and just it's such a beautiful experience and so calming okay so now we're gonna to move to a totally different area and we're gonna to go to the Kalahari and the Kalahari Game Reserve. So the Kalahari Game Reserve is in the Kalahari Desert, which is a large semi-arid uh, sandy savanna in Southern Ontario for extending for 900,000 square kilometers. So it's, it's very large. Um, it goes, uh, it's, Inside of it is um, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, kind of covering all those areas. If you remember back to the map we kind of looked at before, uh, its harsh, sprawling terrain is dominated by grasslands, home to wildlife such as giraffe, cheetahs, hyenas, and wild dogs. It's the largest and by far the most remote reserve in southern Africa. Um, after the wet season, the reserve becomes a hive of activity for large herds of plains game, including uh, during the drier months, the central Kalahari reveals wide desolate pans, which offer exceptional photographic, photographic opportunities. Sorry, I can't read. The reserve is well known for providing awe-inspiring stargazing experiences. And all through Botswana, the, the stars at night are like nothing I've seen. And we've, uh, we always try and take pictures of them and it's really hard to take pictures of stars and moon and, and such, but just beautiful skies at night. Um, you can see in this picture, uh, the one cheetah is collared. So you can see right here, she has a little collar on. Uh, she's probably the mom of the other two. And often throughout Africa, you can see uh, a lot of the animals might be collared or tagged, and that is for scientific research. They are still wild animals, they're just um, being researched, and that's why you might see that, just for counting purposes and to kind of know where they are and um, where their um, territories are. So we're going to head from Botswana into Namibia, which is another really beautiful area. I can tell you, everybody that I know that's ever been to Namibia has talked about how surprised they were by how much they loved it. So it's, it's really different, but again, very interesting destination. It's home to the world's oldest desert with some of the highest uh, dunes. So that's one thing that you will hear about Namibia is talk of the sand dunes. 
Uh, it contains one of the largest concentrations of rock art in Africa. It has the largest population of free roaming cheetahs in the world. It's also home to the second largest canyon in the world, the Grand Canyon, of course, being the first largest. And the Skeleton Coast is the world's biggest grave site for sailors and ships. So the Skeleton Coast along here, you can see, where's my marker? So kind of along here with the Atlantic Ocean, the cold water from the Atlantic Ocean hitting kind of this desert landscape causes fog. And I guess um, that's just very treacherous for ships. And so along this coast, you'll see lots of wrecks of ships. Um, so let's look at some of the areas and national parks in uh, Namibia. So Mengedi National Park is actually just this little tiny one right here. And that, oh, it's, it's such a, it's a very small park, but it was formerly dedicated to breeding rare and endangered species. So it's kind of a cool park and place to go to see, see these animals. Uh, it's transformed into a national park that they hope would attract the tourists. Um, and then from there, we can go to Atosha National Park, which is right here. This is the most popular tourist attraction in the country. It's widely considered to be Namibia's best national park. It's an impressive array of animal wildlife in the park. And visitors, if you're lucky, you can catch a glimpse of the rare endangered black rhino, as well as the more common white rhino. And then we're gonna move over to Kadam National Park, which is right over here. And this is a fairly, uh, small national park and it's also fairly hard to get to um, just because it's it's the remote location kind of over here and you're gonna not have a lot of roadways like you can see that when you see that there's in this whole country there's not that many roadways it's it's true so getting from one place to another in places like Namibia can take a long time and that's one thing that come can surprise people traveling around Africa is on your tour going from one park to another might take all day and even if it's not that far of a journey it can seem to take a, a fair bit of time so Namibia is a little bit known for that taking a long time between the different destinations um, but you can always look at flying uh, they do small air flights and the, the, on the small aircraft into little flight strips, so a lot of lodges and such. Um, and the other thing with Kadam is that it's right next to Botswana, so there's, there's no fences here or anything like that, and all these animals that Botswana has, they're so famous for, can freely go back and forth into this park. Namib Nafluk uh, National Park is down here. Um, and this was originally created by the Germans to form a buffer against encroaching British interest. Uh, Namib Nakluf National Park has expanded over the years to become the nation's largest conservation area. So that's the largest conservation area you can get in Namibia. And then um, last but not least, we have the Skeleton Coast National Park down here. And although Visitors are often attracted to the park due to its name and unforgettable rusting shipwrecks. It has a lot more to offer. It has some amazing sand dunes, mountain ranges, gaping canyons, breathtaking trekking, and elephants, rhino, and lions in the park. And so it's, it's certainly a not to be missed in kind of great park right there. Okay. So that is pretty much what you might want to see in South Africa. And now we're going to head over to East Africa. Um, in East Africa, the first country we're going to look at is in Tanzania. So some of the highlights that we would see in Tanzania are going to be the Serengeti, and the Serengeti National Park over here. Mount Kilimanjaro, or Mount Kili, as it's often called, which is right here. 
and Zanzibar Island, which is a great kind of beach holiday to end off your safari trip. Okay, so let's start in the Serengeti. Um, this is a park that was established in 1951 and covers 5,700 square miles of some of the best grand grassland in Africa, as well as extensive acacia woodland savanna. So you often hear about savanna and getting into Tanzania and even Kenya to a point is that where you're going to see savanna. So this, this grassland with the acacia trees kind of popping out, that's savanna. Elephants uh, were not found in the Serengeti uh, until about 30 years ago and they moved in as human populations and agricultural developments increased. Um, on a sad kind of but interesting note, uh, 30,000 domestic dogs in the area have been devastating for some of the wildlife. The last of the Serengeti's wild dogs disappeared in 1991, they believed due to rabies from the unvaccinated domestic dogs, and an epidemic of canine distemper caused the deaths of nearly one third of the area's lions in 1994. Um, I did see just recently that Tanzania is looking for vets or vet techs that would like to go volunteer to actually go to Tanzania and vaccinate some of these dogs. Now they're they're domestic dogs but they're a lot of them aren't they're basically strays and a lot of them aren't owned um, or living with families and so uh, many diseases are kind of running rampant through these dogs and then as the dogs have you know wander through it becomes contagious to the wildlife and also dangerous for the people so it's kind of an important endeavor to try and get there and get some of these animals vaccinated. Um, the Great Migration is a huge draw for people to head to Tanzania and Kenya. Um, this is where you have millions of wildebeest traveling from one area to another um, in search of, of seasonal food and grasslands and such. Um, so it, it's mostly wildebeest or the biggest numbers are the wildebeest, but there's also zebras and some antelope that do this too. Um, it's quite a spectacular sight and happens generally July to November. Again, in nature, nothing is set in stone and there's not exact dates that it happens, but it does happen for a fairly long period of time enough that you could plan a trip around it and catch some of it. Um, and one of the most spectacular sights is when they're crossing the Mara River uh, and just watching, and that's that picture there of them kind of scooting up the, the side after crossing the river. It's uh, spectacular to see, as I said, and you can see it from either vehicles and, and normal game drive uh, type of vehicles, or you can also see it from uh, hot air balloons, which is a kind of a popular way to um, to cut in Tanzania and they do in Kenya and you do the balloon which is a quiet peaceful kind of way to go over the savanna and the Serengeti and see the animals um, on their migration. I see I see the light is coming in from outside on me and I can't help it so but you should be looking at the slides not me anyway. Okay, so let's look at um, Mount Kilimanjaro, which is uh, another big attraction uh, for some to come to Africa. Some people come to Africa just to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So it's, it's a real kind of tourist area. Um, it's actually a dormant volcano and it is the tallest mountain in Africa and the fourth tallest in the world. It's very popular in both experienced hikers and first time adventurers because it's considered to be the easiest of the seven summits. Scaling the mountain requires no technical skills or equipment. It's hiking or a walk up to the peak, not mountaineering or climbing up to the peak. However, more than, or they, it's estimated two thirds to 50% of all climbers fail, and that's mostly due to altitude sickness. Uh, it's the world's tallest freestanding mountain, so that means it's not part of a mountain range, and that has to do with it being uh, volcanic. And um, 
And the fastest ascent and descent of Kelly was completed by Swiss Carl Egloff in just six hours and 42 minutes. So it's up and down, That's pretty impressive. Um, and the oldest to climb was in 89, was 89 years old. The youngest to climb was six years old. And interesting enough, they were both female. Uh, one man in a wheelchair has summited twice. Almost every kind of ecological system is found on the mountain. There's cultivated land, rainforest, heath, moorland, alpine desert, and an Arctic summit. Now to our little beach vacation here at Zanzibar, um, also known as the Spice Island. It's actually a series of smaller islands. Um, Stone Town is well known and one of the oldest cities in Zanzibar as well as in Africa in general. Um, so it's a great kind of getaway at the end of a trip, especially if you're in Kenya or Tanzania anyway. So it's... Um, it's, a, it's just a nice little add-on that you can do. It's relatively inexpensive, all things considered, to go to Zanzibar and they have some beautiful resorts and beach hotels. Um, the water there is that lovely blue, nice white sand beaches. Um, so it can be just a, a, a nice add-on. You wouldn't want to go for any extended period of time because there's probably not a lot to do besides beach type holiday things, but it is definitely a great add-on. Okay, so now we're going to move up north a bit from Tanzania, and we're going to head into Kenya. Um, so Kenya itself has a great assortment of national parks. Um, we can go through these. The Masamara National Park is right here, and that's the one that the migration's happening to, so it's butting right against the Serengeti in Tanzania. It's the most popular wildlife park, park in Kenya. And then Lake Nakuru is right here. And it's famous for its huge flocks of flamingos that enjoy the alpine waters of this shallow soda lake. Then we can go to Amboseli National Park, which is just right down here. And from Amboseli, we can get great views of Mount Kili, which is just over the border here in Tanzania. And then we also have Savo National Park. And so we have east and west down in here. Uh, Savo is uh vast in the landscape is very wild east is a little less developed than west but more accessible um and then also there's nairobi national park which is going to be right by nairobi or actually sorry right down here <laughs> um it's one of Kenya's most successful black rhino sanctuaries. Also has its own wildebeest migration, as well as hosting over 400 species of birds. So the Maasai people are a Neolithic ethnic group inhabiting the northern, central, and southern Kenya and northern Tanzania. Maasai men are first and foremost warriors. They protect their tribe, their cattle, and their grazing animals. Maasai society is strongly patriarchal in nature, with elder men sometimes joined by retired elders, deciding the most important matters for each of the Maasai group. They wear the color red to represent power. Let's have a look at a couple unique animal experiences in Kenya that are actually quite famous. So first we're going to talk about Giraffe Manor um, and it's a small kind of boutique hotel right in Nairobi and together with its associated giraffe center it serves as a home to a number of endangered Rothschild giraffes. Then operates a breeding program to reintroduce breeding pairs back into the wild. One of the most fascinating things about Giraffe Manor is its resident herd of Rothschild giraffes who may visit every morning and evening 
poking their long necks into the windows in hopes of a treat before retiring back to the forest sanctuary. Due to its popularity and gen its generally full occupancy, travelers who are not staying at Giraffe Manor cannot just show up for breakfast or afternoon teas. However, the Giraffe Center is open to the public daily and guests can stroke and feed the giraffes from raised platforms. As you can mention, imagine, uh, Giraffe Manor is fairly exclusive and it is expensive. It costs about a $1,000 a night to stay there, but eh, it could be worth it, I think. Um, and then the other one is the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust Orphanage. And the David Sheldrick Trust, Wildlife Trust Elephant Nursery is in Nairobi National Park and provides a ha safe haven for orphaned baby elephants. It's open to the public for one hour each day. During this time, elephants or sorry, during this time, orphans can be witnessed enjoying a milk feed and mud bath or a so soil dusting on cooler days. The visit is intended to provide an opportunity for visitors to learn about the work of the Shelter Wildlife Trust in the rescue and rehabilitation of orphaned elephants, with one of their keepers giving a talk throughout the visiting hour, during which time they will tell stories of different orphans in their care and explain about the process of raising milk-dependent baby elephants. With information provided about the wider threats facing elephants and the reasons there are, they are orphans, as well as the work being done by the Sheldrick Trust and other organizations to protect elephants and wildlife in Kenya. The visit is both educational and informative. Throughout the talk, the elephants will be enjoying themselves eating greens, drinking their milk, playing with one another, and on hotter days, splashing around in the mud. And the Shelter Trust Orphanage Fund, Orphanage is open every day, except for Christmas Day, and you can go for just that one hour. And the entrance fee is just a donation. Okay, so we're gonna leave Kenya now and head a little further north up to Ethiopia, which is gonna give us a totally different experience than what we've been seeing so far. This is a landlocked country and it's split by the Great Rift Valley and great archeological finds dating back more than 3 million years. It's a place of ancient culture. And that's and this trip to Ethiopia is gonna be a more cultural experience. It's gonna be about the architecture and the people there and, and such, and a little bit less about the animals on this particular, in this particular country. Now let's have a look at some of the key attractions that you might see in Ethiopia. Uh, Lalabella is where the rock hewn churches are, and it's probably the best known attraction of Ethiopia. There's 11 medieval churches that were cut and carved out of rock. It's said they were built by King Lalibela, who called them the New Jerusalem. At, as at the time, in the 12th century, the Muslims had stopped the Christians from their pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Uh, then the Omu Valley, which is home to several indigenous groups where traditions are upheld. The Omu River Basin is one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites due to fossil and tool finds that date back more than 2.4 million years. Some of the more famous Omu Valley tribes are the Mercy. The Mercy are known for their lip plate tradition, and that's what we can see here. An unmarried woman's lower lip will be pierced and then progressively stretched over a period of a year. The, a clay disc indented like a pulley wheel is squeezed into the hole in the lip. As it stretches, ever larger discs are forced in until the lip, now a loop, is so long that it can sometimes be pulled right over the owner's head. The size of the lip plate determines the bride price with a large one bringing in 50 head of cattle. The Cairo people excel in face painting and torso painting. Elaborate face masks are created using locally found white, chalk, yellow mineral rock, pulverized iron, ore, and black charcoal. Cairo women scarify their chest to beautify themselves and become more appealing to their men. The scarification of a man's chest is made when he has killed an enemy or, an, or a dangerous animal. And the hammer people, the, to them, the most important event in the Hammer Society is bull jumping, the bull jumping ceremony, the rite which marks the passage of men from one age group to another. 
This ceremony can be attended by tourists during visiting the Hammer territory. And this is Gondor Castle. This building is also called Facilites Castle, and it was built by Emperor Facilites in the 17th century. Gondor was then an important agricultural and trade center in Ethiopia. And there's these beautiful falls. This is the Blue Nile Falls. They're just as spectacular as, and as they should be, one of Ethiopia's top attractions. And Simeon Mountain National Park. So finally hitting a national park here. It's in northern Ethiopia. Its rugged terrain includes escarpments, deep valleys, and high plateaus. It's just absolutely stunning to view. Uh, it's home to the rare Walia ibex and the Galata baboons. Um, that's a Galata baboon sitting right there. Uh, what you won't see is the big five anywhere in Ethiopia or this national park. Okay, so we're leaving Ethiopia and now we are heading to one of my favorite countries in Africa. And I know we have um, one of our partners, Elion from Shanrod, and she's living in Ethiopia. She lives in, uh, sorry, Uganda. So she's probably going to carefully watch my, my talk on Uganda. I will try my best to do it justice because it definitely deserves it. Um, so some interesting notes on beautiful Uganda. It is home to Africa's tallest mountain range. It's home to the source of the Nile and the continent's largest lake, Lake Victoria. Rafting the Nile offers world-class adrenaline adventure. Then you can also see the big five go rhino trekking and chimpanzee trekking. But definitely the country's most iconic experience is tracking mountain gorillas in their misty habitat. So, um, a look, I'm not sure why this little arrow's there. I didn't notice it till later after I did this slide, so just ignore that. Um, we're going to start our little trek around Uganda in Jinja, which is a really cool place and, and very unexpected because, you know, it's just, it seemed so young and adrenaline seekers and fun. And it was like, oh, it was just a kind of a, an unexpected happy surprise in my first time when I got there. Um, so Jinja is going to be famous as an historic source of the Nile River and it's now the adrenaline capital of East Africa. You can get your fix of whitewater rafting, kayaking, quad biking, mountain biking, and horse riding in gorgeous natural setting with a crumbling colonial architecture. And we did a four-hour quad bike ride, which was so tremendously fun. It was just great. So we're gonna leave Jinja and we're gonna go up to Murchison Falls National Park up here. Murchison Falls National Park, it's on the shore of Lake Albert in Northwest Uganda. It's known for the beautiful Murchison Falls you can see right here where the Victoria Nile surges through a narrow gap over a massive drop. And the park wildlife also includes elephants, hippos, and chimpanzees. We're going to head now down a little bit south and we're going to come to Kabali Forest here. In Kabali Forest, we are going chimp trekking. Um, so chimp trekking is a little easier go than the gorilla trekking, which are in the mountain, hence the mountain gorillas. Uh, so chimp trekking is a, it's a fairly flat walk, but you are definitely trekking through the woods. Um, and looking for these guys, they're most likely going to be very high up in the tree. So a lot of walking, looking up, um, but very cool. You have a guide with you that kind of has an idea where they are and they're, they're again talking on their radios. So if anybody does a sighting, you, you know where to go. And it is, um, they're fairly fast if they want to be and <laughs> it'd be a little hard to catch at times when you're trying to get, pictures and, and such, but once they do settle down, 
usually in trees. It's not too often you see them sing on the ground like this, but usually up in trees. But you can just get amazing pictures and watch them. And that's the thing. It, on any safari, I always tell people, do take time. You want to get those pictures. You want to get that, that really, really good picture that you're going to take home and show everybody and talk about what you did or post on social media, which is great. Don't forget to take time to watch. Get that picture and then put the camera down and just watch and enjoy and be there in the moment because that's a moment, no matter how many pictures you take, you're not getting that moment back. So don't forget to enjoy that moment. So after Kabali, we're gonna head to Queen Elizabeth National Park, just down here. Um, in Queen Elizabeth National Park, you're going to see, you could see the Big Five. Um, you can see a lot of the big animals. I'm not sure if there's rhinos. Oh, I'm sure maybe Ellie knows that. She can tell me. I can't remember if I've ever seen a rhino there. Um, but a lot of, lot of the, the big mammals that you're going to see anywhere else, you're going to see there. The one animal I haven't seen there is zebras, um, but you can see them, I believe, up in Murchison. And um, the, there's also the Kazinga Channel, which runs through the one side of the park. And it is just wonderful to go on a boat ride up the Kazinga Channel. The, the Chobe River is, is so amazing. But every time I go on the Chobe River, I think these people need to go on the Kazinga Channel because, you know, you can see hippos on the Chobe River. The number of hippos in the Kazinga Channel is just crazy. Um, and plus other wildlife that you're going to see going up and down the channel is, is just, it, it's breathtaking and unbelievable that there can be that much wildlife that close. When you're in a boat, you can just seem to get so close to it. Um, the other thing really cool in Queen Louis National Park, as you can see this guy here, is sitting in a tree. Typically, lions don't hang out in trees. Lions in everywhere else are stay on the ground. Um, for some reason, and I'm not sure they know why, in Queen Elizabeth National Park, lions have taken to going up in the trees, which is a little unusual and pretty cool to see. So now we're going to leave Queen Elizabeth National Park and we're going to come down here to Buendi for the start of our Uganda show. So they call Windy the impenetrable forest, and they're not kidding, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a very thick trek. Um, so whenever you're gorilla trekking, you will start off on main pass, but then you have to go to wherever the gorilla happens to be. And they have trackers who know where they are and they'll tell you, so your guide will take you there, but at a certain point, you're usually leaving that path to head through through thicker kind of um, walkway. So be prepared for that. Um, I could talk for an hour quite easily about gorilla trekking. It's one of my favorite things ever, and um, it, it's really, really an experience that if you're interested, you need to do. Don't not do it. Do it. Um, but we can't take up an hour talking about gorilla tracking today. So if you are interested in gorilla tracking, if you go either to our YouTube channel or on our website to previous travel talks, we did a previous, um, travel talk just on gorilla tracking. So if you want to listen to that, that will give you all the details of how it goes and how it works. Um, but just you know to be known it's there are mountain gorillas it is a trek up um a mountain usually to find them and then back down again it can be a quite arduous trek um or but it can also not be so um when you show up to do your tracking you have a few options you you tell them you know yes i'm here to trek all day or no you know i i really need an easier track for this. And they have an idea of where the different um, gorilla troops are. So they'll put you accordingly into the troop that works for you that way. The other option you have is if you truly 
can't do the track, if you, you know, you've got bad knees or you just have it's an issue that's going to prevent you from being that active and doing the track, which is difficult, you can opt to have the porters carry you in a chair. Um, and don't ever be afraid or embarrassed or worried about doing this. Every tour we've done, every time we've gone gorilla trekking, we have had um, ladies that have opted for this. So you have to pay for it. It's, I think, about $300. So it's not, not you know, free. But in the grand scheme of things, you've come a long way to see and do this. So it is definitely worth doing. So, and it's, it's easy to arrange and a possibility. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, but yeah, so Bwindi is uh, our last trek or last stop in Uganda to see the gorillas. And now we're going to move on to a very small country right here, Rwanda, which is just underneath Uganda and next to the Congo. So when you talk about mountain gorillas, mountain gorillas only live in a very small area in this whole wide world. They live in this corner right here. They live in Uganda, they live in Rwanda, and they live in the Congo, but just in this corner of all three countries, which kind of share them. Um, and we don't really go to the Congo very much right now. Um, so we're more apt to either do the, to see gorillas when we're in Uganda, or we can do gorilla trekking in Rwanda. And so we'll talk about that for a second. So Volcanoes National Park is where you see gorillas in Rwanda. And um, it is very much the same experience that you would do in Bundi. Um, I've done it in both places and it was, you know, you're, you're doing the same track, you're doing it up mountains. Um, the, what I would say is Rwanda has a little bit better infrastructure. So it's got um, the roads are, you know, paved and, and it's got the town that you come out of is, is quite beautiful and um, has great infrastructure. Um, they have, they do a, a nice show before you go trekking. Um, they have a great selection of rubber um, boots if you want to rent a pair of boots, which it's very muddy. It's always very muddy. So boots are a great idea, either your own or theirs, or gaiters, which are um, the little coverings that go over top of your boots and pants. So that's all great. But once you actually get into the trekking, the guides and the porters and the actual trekking itself and the gorillas you're going to see are all very much the same. And it's interesting of note that Uganda gorilla trekking, so Bwindi gorilla trekking is literally half the price it is in Rwanda. Um, and so, and it depends, it's like that's going to be a personal decision, maybe is worthwhile to to be in Rwanda and have that experience for you and you don't mind paying that um, or maybe you want to save the money for something else and do it in uh, Uganda but don't think that for some reason paying double the price in Rwanda is going to change your experience at all and you're still going to have the same gorilla trekking experience. Uh, one thing Rwanda, Rwanda does have that is, is kind of good, is they have the Diane Fossey camp, which you can trek up to, and that is uh, got actually the, you know, ruins of uh, where her research happened and her cabin and her lab. Um, it also has the uh, grave sites for her her and a lot of her beloved gorillas. So um, that is something really kind of neat that you can do in Rwanda that's only available in Rwanda. Um, but Rwanda is a, a kind of upcoming safari destination. It might not be a destination you pick to go just for itself for safari, but you maybe want to add it on to something some other kind of trip that you've got going on. It's got a couple other um, national parks of no. Akagera National Park, uh, which lies in eastern Rwanda. It hugs the border of Tanzania. 
and it's woodlands and swamps, low mountains and savanna. And the very terrain has um, fairly good wildlife that a lot of times, because it is boring with Tanzania, so you're getting zebras and giraffes and elephants and lions and lots of species of birds. Uh, the other one is the Nyangwangi uh, Forest National Park. And this uh, park is in southeast Rwanda, and it's partly abutting the Burundi border. It has uh, very mountainous terrain and rainforest, and lots of it has um, many species of chimpanzees, owl faced, and colobus monkeys. Um, it's also got a really cool kind of pathway system through it. So it's a great trekking park if you want to trek and some beautiful scenery. Um, and also um, like uh, cloud bridges over the, over the canopy bridges to, to walk along. So it's a really kind of beautiful walking park. Okay. So now we've done that, we're going to head out to an island here. We're going to head out to Madagascar. And Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. Um, it's a paradise for wildlife lovers. It's considered mega diverse um, because it's got so many different species that can be found nowhere else. So think of something like Galapagos where it's, it's secluded so it's got these species that you just don't see anywhere else. Um, it's also been lar largely undisturbed by humans for so long and it's among its residents of animals, you're gonna have half the world's chameleons and dozens of species of lemurs. It's a birder's paradise. It has a bird called the long-tailed ground roller, which is unique and considered by bird watchers to be one of the world's most elusive species. And epic landscapes, the flora fauna, um, are incredibly offer this incredible diversity. You can go from rainforest to desert in just 300 kilometers and few places on the earth offer such an intense kaleidoscope of nature. Sandstone canyons, mountains, fertile hills, cascading with rice terrace pad rice terraced rice paddies, forests of every kind, uh, dry, uh, uh, Laterite rich soil that give the country its nickname of the Red Island. Um, the of note is that uh, tourism is fairly new and and developing in Madagascar. So some of the infrastructure that you might expect or have in some of these other countries that have, are very developed in the tourism world you might not get in Madagascar. So the roads might not be great, it might take them longer to get from point A to point B. And some of the hotels and such might not be of the level of hotel that you might get say in Botswana or Tanzania. Um, but they are, they are quickly upcoming and it is definitely a very cool place to see. And um, with that being said, because it is developing, it's not, it's a lot less expensive than other destinations in um, Africa. But you're also not going to see the big mammals that you're going to see um, on the mainland in some of those, those big safari destinations. So you're, you're getting a little bit different kind of um, look at Africa here. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, a, a beautiful kind of add-on or destination itself, um, beach vacation, and we're going to the Seychelles, um, which would be right about here, but they're so small they don't show up on my map, so I'm getting a little red dot. Yeah, it's hard to dot with the mouse, but that is where you would find the Seychelles. And this is a cluster of charming islands and it's in that, those warm waters of the Indian Ocean. And it has a selection of beautiful high-end res luxury resorts. Uh, and you would definitely want to see the giant tortoises that live there. 
um, while there aren't a lot of sites to see it, it's, it's very much a beach vacation. There's a few things that, you, you know, I think there's a tea plantation, a distillery, and a few things to see on the islands, but mostly it's just a beach type trip. So you're snorkeling and you're out on a boat and you're spending time on the beach. Um, beautiful add-on to a luxury type tour that you might be having in um, one of the other countries. Say you did a, a great safari and you want to come out for a few days of um, beautiful luxury beach. But this is like one of the idyllic island kind of areas that you know, Put it in class with the Maldives and Bora Bora. It's going to be a more expensive type of trip because you're you're definitely talking kind of luxury and everything is it's fairly far out there and everything's being brought in. Okay, so now we've done Southern Africa and now we've done Eastern Africa. We're going to head up to uh, Northern Africa, which. For me, when I think of Africa, uh, Northern Africa countries, to me, seem more Middle East. But they are definitely Africa, and I'm sure the people that live in them would be not thrilled to hear me say it. <laughs> Don't feel Africa to me. But, you know, these are countries that we're going to visit for reasons other than the wildlife, per se. Now, we're going to start with Morocco. Um, Morocco is like i think one of the coolest places to visit it's it really is it's only eight miles from europe across the strait of gibraltar and it might be a million for how different it is um casablanca is morocco's largest city rabat is the capital it's the only african african country that is not a member of the african union and it is a predominantly a muslim country um one thing I struck me with Morocco is how diverse it is, how you can be one place one day and someplace else the next day, and they just could be totally different countries for how different they look and how different they seem, all in one country, all within driving distance of each other. So it's just, it's a really, you know, the, a trip that by the time you've done it, you're like, wow, I've been to the sea, to the mountains, to the desert, to, to everywhere in one trip. So it is really, really kind of neat and cool place to go. Um, so we're going to look at just um, a few of these different kind of areas and what they have. So we start in Casablanca, which is got just stunning mosques and this whole French colonial design. It's their biggest city. So, um, you know, it does have big city things in it too, just regular, you know, shopping centers and busy streets and, and such. Um, and then also Rick's Cafe, if you want. <laughs> so from there, let's go to Lobul, ah, Volubilis, um, which is the ancient Roman ruins. Um, these are some of the best preserved Roman ruins, and they're located between the imperial series, uh, cities of Fez and Meknes. The Atlas Mountains. Um, being North America's highest mountain range, High Atlas is properly known as the Mountain of Mountains. This is a place for paradise for trekkers, especially from spring to autumn. And like being there, all of a sudden you're getting up so high in altitude and it's cold and you were, you know, hot the day before somewhere else. So it, and it is truly very mountain, like going up into the Atlas Mountains and you come to a little town and it'll have a, it, it'll look, remind you of Nepal with like the way the streets are and little shop that's selling used hiking boots for somebody that might want to go hiking and you can just, you know, use them and bring them back and resell them back to the same guy who resells them again. It's basically renting hiking boots. The seaside, Yushuria, is, um, it's very popular. It was very popular in the, back in the 60s um, when it was a beach hangout for celebrities like Jimi Hendrix and Bob Marley. And you might recognize it now because it was one of the places that Game of Thrones was filmed. 
the blue city, Shefshuan, is popular for solo travelers who want to take the time just kind of exploring the this famous blue and white painted houses throughout the, the cute little kind of walkway streets remind you kind of the the streets of greece where it's tiny little walkways and um when you go into like not like the big cities but into the countryside and the little seaside villages of greece and that kind of feel um and from afar it does the, the whole city does look like blue and then the Hollywood of Morocco, which is was is that if you've always fancied the Arab desert scenes and scenes in Hollywood movies, you'll be excited to know that some of your favorite desert classics may have passed through Morocco at some point during their filming. It's been filming the Hollywood directors since the 60s. Um, and you could think of famous like Star Wars, I think had um, parts filmed here, um, The Gladiator, so many famous movies that you would know had parts filmed here. Um, the famous Medinas uh, of Morocco, um, they're just a maze of souks and chops and you'd be delighted or, um, you know, amazed, impressed, maybe, <laughs> by the sights and the smells and the colors um, as you wander through. It, there's such a labyrinth of um, shops and souks that you almost for sure need a guide or you could get lost. And it's really neat. Um, often the different shop owners, you go through areas. So you go through like a silver kind of tinsmith area, or you'll go through a stained glass area or the leather area. And it, it really makes for part of the experience as you, as you wander through. Um, sometimes people are, are nervous about this and they find um, the Moroccan shop holders can be pushy and some can. Um, but generally, if you just say no, thank you, or if you stop and talk to them about what they're selling, they're just interested to talk to you and tell you about it. And if you say no, thank you, they, they take it. Um, there's exceptions to that, of course, but for the most part, they're very, you know, nice, easy to talk to, not, you know, they'll try and sell you stuff for sure. That's, that's how they are and how they work, but they also take no quite, quite easily. And then the desert. This is always the favorite part on our Morocco tours. Um, even so much that we've added extra days to the desert experience for Morocco because everybody loves being out in the Sahara. Um, the sand is truly red, redder than you would ever believe. And um, the tented camps, when you have a tented camp, it's such a luxury tented camp. It's unbelievable to think it's out in the middle of sand like this out in the middle of nowhere um and it's so cool and one of the things i did in morocco on these dunes was i did um basically snowboarding or sandboarding down the dune and it was just like a regular snowboard like you would have to go snowboarding and you would just slide it you just ride it down and then you had to carry it back up because there's no ski lifts in the middle of the dunes but you'd have to walk back up so it was really, really cool experience. Okay, and now on to our last, but definitely not least country we're gonna look at in Africa, which is Egypt. Um, definitely a huge tourist kind of area. Um, it's often a big bucket list for people to go to Egypt. And it just kind of makes sense why, when what is there, is there and it's not anywhere else in this world. So about 90% of Egypt is Muslim. And one of the most famous figures tied to Egypt, Cleopatra VII, was actually Greek. <laughs> most ancient Egyptian pyramids were built as tombs for pharaohs and their families. The afterlife was incredibly important to Egyptians. They believed that by preserving dead person's body, which they did through the process of mummification, their soul would live on in the afterlife forever. The pyramid, pyramid of Khafu at Giza is the largest Egyptian pyramid. 
The ancient Egyptians invented lots of things we use today, such as paper pens, locks and keys, and believe it or not, toothpaste. So let's have a look at some of the top Egypt attractions. Um, the Egyptian Museum, which is in Cairo, and it's home to 120,000 items of ancient Egyptian antiquities. Abosaval is an archaeological site comprising of two massive rock cut, uh, cut, yeah, rock cut temples in southern Egypt on the western bank of Lake Nasser. The twin temples were originally carved out of the mountain during the reign of the pharaoh Ramses the Great in the 13th century BC as a lasting monument to himself and his queen Neferati. The Valley of the Kings, which is near Luxor, is a valley where, for a period of nearly 500 years from the 16th to the 11th century BC, tombs were constructed for the kings and privileged nobles of the New Kingdom. The valley contains 63 tombs and chambers, ranging in size from a simple pit to a complex tomb with over 220 chambers. A Nile River Cruise. Cruising the Nile is a popular way of visiting Upper Egypt. The Nile River has been Egypt's lifeline since ancient times, and there's no better way to trace the passage of Egypt's history than to follow the course of the Nile. Almost all of the Egyptian cruise ships travel the Luxor Aswan route, which is safe, scenic, and terminates at two of Egypt's most important towns. Oh, the beautiful Red Sea Reef. It's off the coast of Egypt. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world to go diving. The waters of the Red Sea are renowned for their spectacular visibility and feature some of the most exotic seascapes. The wide range of coral formation on the reefs is home to thousands of different sea creatures. Karnak. Um, although badly ruined, few sites in Egypt are more impressive than Karnak. It's the largest ancient religious site ever built and represents the combined achievement of many generations of Egyptian builders. And last but not least, for sure, are the Pyramids of Giza. The Pyramids of Giza, situated in the immediate vicinity of the southern suburbs of Cairo, are the undisputed top attraction in Egypt. The Pyramids of Giza were built over a span of three generations. So that brings an end to our little whirlwind tour throughout Africa. I hope that some of it interested you and some of it made you think, oh, that's where I want to go. Um, I love Africa. I can't wait to get back. It's always had a part of my, from the first moment I, I was there, it's, it's got a part of me. And it, once you, if you're bitten by the Africa bug, you will, you'll understand what I mean. Um, so if um, you do think of any questions, please send us a message. Uh, we'd love to chat about Africa some more and really um, appreciate everybody taking the time and being with us. It was definitely my favorite subject to talk about and I look forward to seeing everyone on a tour in Africa at some point. Have a great night and take care and we will talk soon.